I guess the first thing I'd like to ask you is to, to recap for us your central message for the librarians who were in the audience because there are a great many of us who couldn't be here today in New Orleans. So what was your real central message to librarians? Well, as, as librarians, they are custodians of history to a large extent and of, uh, and of the journalism that's the current history, the first draft of history that they say you have a lot of those books. And now, of course, the internet uh, is in the library. So, uh, which means the entire uh, output of WikiLeaks so far. And uh, I'm, my message to begin with was that the situation today is remarkably similar to the one that the country was facing or the president was facing um, 40 years ago when the Pentagon Papers and 42 years ago and before that, namely a question of whether what to do with respect to an unwinnable war that we were heavily involved in. I'm speaking primarily of Afghanistan now, uh, but a number of other wars that we really are involved in, whether the president calls some wars or not, uh, in uh, uh, Iraq, where I think, by the way, fighting may well expand again uh, within the next year, uh, Pakistan, Yemen, and uh, other places where we really are involved in hostilities with drones and other respects. And the question is uh, whether to extricate ourselves in one way or another, unilaterally or negotiation, from one or more of those wars, whether to expand them markedly as the military is advising in some cases, or whether to do what president after president did in Vietnam and President Obama is choosing right now, and that is essentially to prolong uh, the war, to keep it from ending while he is in office, when, which might expose him to charges of being weak, unmanly, even foreign in his case, uh, but uh, an appeaser and uh, a man who had chosen to lose a war that the military said was unwinnable. And however foolish that promise was of winnability, and however foolish and unrealistic the charges are, being a loser and a quitter, and we, the president doesn't want to hear them. And typically in Vietnam, and I believe now, uh, the assumption, the hypothesis, that the history is very similar now, uh, re, re, reenacting. Uh, presidents uh, prefer to send men and women now to die and to kill rather than be called names themselves, rather than risk re-election, rather than risk their place in history. And that's a very typical choice, uh, cynical as that may sound, by presidents in the past. I don't think that President Obama is worse or different from the others, but that's not a justifiable cause. That's not a legitimate reason, and it's practically the only reason that we are still involved with over 100,000 troops and 100,000 mercenaries in Afghanistan right now, and it's not good enough. It often seems to me when I was listening to you talk that uh, the question that doesn't seem to get asked in, in cases like Afghanistan, as it wasn't asked, it seems to me, in, in Vietnam, is what would a win look like? Well, actually, uh, a win is not as th that hard to define. It's just impossible to achieve. Uh, my boss, John McNaughton in Vietnam, is in the Pentagon Papers defining in some detail what a win in Vietnam would be like and claiming at that time that that was our objective. Namely, that all, take Vietnam now, all <coughs> northern troops uh, in South Vietnam would go back to the north and take with them the southerners, this is getting into history here, but the southerners who had gone north after Geneva in 54 and then come back, so-called regroupees. But all people under the command of the communist leadership of the resistance there should go back to North Vietnam. The remaining people, the southern guerrillas, let's say, should lay down their arms and do it visibly, not just bury them, but give in their arms or uh, amalgamate and accept the discipline of the South Vietnamese troops that we supplied and trained and, and uh, funded and everything else. You could define conditions just like that in Afghanistan. The Taliban quit or go back to Pakistan, go wherever they came from, the foreigners. The Taliban are, are pretty indigenous. But if there are any Al-Qaeda people, they all leave. The Taliban join the Afghan army that we're funding, or they give up their arms. All coded communications on the other side must cease. So all, it's a very precise term. All, all communications will be in the clear, so we can hear them, and here there's no, 
no covert call to continue arms, and so forth. In other words, the authority of the regime in the capital that we support and fund and back, that serves our interests, shall be extended to every corner of the country. And that doesn't mean there's no violence anymore, but it does mean that violence is reduced to a point where his mercenary soldiers can be paid with the drug money and the drug money that we, and the money we supply in order to pursue those few remaining holdouts indefinitely without the need for American troops. So we have indefinitely a regime in the capital uh, whose authority is extended to the whole country without the need of American troops, just with American firepower. We never really, uh, air power. We never really aspired in Vietnam to a situation where they wouldn't need our air support. We didn't tell the public that, but that was Nixon's game and that was Johnson's game. So with continued now would be drones, or then on cruise missiles, but then it was planes entirely from carriers or bases outside the country. We could support the mercenaries that supported us essentially, and they could control the whole country without our presence there. That's a victory. No one would say, even though there might be some remaining violence, no one would argue with that as being a victory. It just was far, far, far beyond our, our capabilities. Do you think that the, the media, I mean, uh, Vietnam was uh, called the first war that was televised, and do you think that now that we have the internet, uh, that the, the media's response and the way that we're learning about the war and various wars that we're involved in, uh, has changed the game at all? Well, it certainly, uh, the television did have a big impact in Vietnam. Uh, remember that public opinion didn't have that much impact on the president's policy. Uh, the public was against the war in Vietnam by majority. By 1968, uh, years before the Pentagon Papers came out, that majority was increased by the Pentagon Papers, but it was already a majority. That didn't stop the president. And the fact that uh, you see different figures between 56% and 71% or something of Americans now think we should be out of Afghanistan as soon as possible does not mean we will be out of that war anytime soon. Uh, I said that people had that opinion in 68. The war went on for seven years. And troops remained there for five years. Uh, that could easily, we could be in, in Afghanistan indefinitely no matter how many people are against the war. But it is true that the, the more you can see it up close on television, uh, the more public opinion will be affected. But remember, uh, without American troops dying, the YouTube material, which now is available, wasn't available then, from my cell phones, doesn't get on our mainstream media. That Then, the television that existed was minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, every night on television. People, my, my later wife, told me uh, in 66 when she came over and we got engaged in Vietnam that she made me aware that she was seeing more of the war than anybody in Saigon was because she saw it on the television every night. We didn't see that. But uh, now with YouTube, no Americans dying, uh, no, meaning only a few thousand. So uh, uh, you don't see it on the television. So yes, the, uh, for example, uh, WikiLeaks, did put out on the, on the internet that cable, that uh, video of the helicopter. And I think uh, it got, of course, enormous number of hits. But I think that uh, my understanding is that Assange felt later that he'd been mistaken not to make a deal initially with a mainstream television network and get it out on, on mainstream. And that's why later he worked with the New York Times directly and with The Guardian, because you do get greater coverage that way. Um, you mentioned that you didn't, when you were talking yesterday, you mentioned that uh, you didn't really think that the draft was such a big factor in the Vietnam War, the difference... Well, it was a big factor, but I'm, I'm saying that it wasn't the whole factor that everybody speaks about now. Yeah, it surprised me because I always thought that if, if there were a draft right now, you'd see a great deal more resistance. You undoubtedly would, no question you would, but you'd also see much bigger wars. I think that if we had a draft now, we'd have big demonstrations, we'd have a lot more talk about it in Congress and the press, and we'd have several hundred thousand men and women in Afghanistan right now, and in Iraq. You just can't do that without a draft. No way to do it. And we couldn't have put 500,000 men into Vietnam, which remember, they got there in 68 after years of demonstrations 
we were up to 550,000. Uh, you couldn't have done that without a draft. So I'm against the draft. Uh, yes, it would be more fair. And if, if you could have a draft where the total number of soldiers remained the same, I'd be for that. It would be fairer and just, but that's not the way it's going to work. If you have a draft, it's still going to be the poorer people who are in the front lines. That's the way that works in every army. And uh, you're going to have a lot bigger armed services. And so we'll have more men and women now to spend. By the way, I would think, I don't see how a draft can avoid drafting women at this point. Uh, that wasn't even a question before, but with the current uh, correct attitude, uh, there, isn't, there isn't any way you could draft men and not women. So uh, you'll be sending them over there, uh, to have, uh, and it will not win the war. <laughs> it will just be a bigger war. If, if I had uh, uh, a secret there, There's where I differ from a lot of my close friends. Uh, on that, like Pete McCloskey or earlier Ted Kennedy, he wasn't a close friend, but an ally, and uh, who are very much for, for a draft for that reason, but I disagree with them. If I had top secret information that could stop the war in Afghanistan, what would you tell me to do with it now? Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, first, I would go to the New York Times, first in hopes that they would print large amounts of it, large amounts of documents. No other paper really offers to print pages and pages of newsprint on something. But I wouldn't wait for months, uh, as I did, in case, without being told. They were actually working away at it right away, but they didn't tell me. And uh, if I had gone months without knowing that they were working away on it, I would now then have gone to other papers, and if that didn't work, to Wiki WikiLeaks. So I wouldn't go first to WikiLeaks. Uh, or if I did, I would do it on the understanding that they do it the way they did now, which was a pretty good model, that they coordinate with not just one paper, but several papers creating that competition so that no one paper feels they can bottle it up by sitting on it the way the New York Times did. Here's a question, it just came to me as, as you asked the question. What if the people who gave the information to the Times in 2004 about the warrantless wiretaps by NSA, which the Times sat on for a year, Bill Keller should have been fired, ultimately, when it came out that he had suppressed that news for a year at the request of the White House. News that was should have been out, absolutely should have been out. He finally put it out because of competition from his own reporter, James Risen, who was about to put it out in a book. And rather than be scooped by Risen, he finally brought it out in the Times and got a Pulitzer Prize for it. Fine, I'd let him have his Pulitzer Prize in jail. Uh, for, well, he, not, jail isn't the right thing. Firing is what I mean. If he could have been impeached, he should have been impeached uh, for that. So uh, his Pulitzer Prize, uh, which he could enjoy with Judith Miller somewhere, uh, wherever, wherever she is. So um, his former protege. Um, but supposing, then, the people who did that had simultaneously given it to WikiLeaks or to another paper, uh, so that Keller knew he couldn't sit on it for a year. That's the way to get it out, and that's the way WikiLeaks got it out, because each, the Guardian, Der Spiegel, uh, El Pais, uh, all knew, and the Times, and Le Monde, that uh, if they didn't put it out, others would. So that using that competition very effectively, that's, the way to, that's what I would tell you to do. And I would say that the people right now who are talking to Bob Woodward about his next book, now, I suppose that includes Rahm Emanuel again, and uh, uh, Eichenberry, who's leaving Cabo and so forth. Rather than wait a year or two for that to come out, it would be better if they gave the documents supporting that information to WikiLeaks right now. And as a matter of fact, I, I would call on Woodward to give all the documents he was given for that book. I'm not asking him to put him out because he would get prosecuted. Even he would get prosecuted by by Obama, and it wouldn't serve any great purpose. Give them to WikiLeaks anonymously. Let us read them, so that he isn't the only one who gets to read these top secret documents. If I were Henry Kissinger sitting across from you right now, what would you tell me? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Actually, I there's a couple people, including McNamara and Kissinger, uh, now only Kissinger is alive to tell the tale about some of the decision making. So really, my interest would be in trying to get him at last, in the closing years of his life like mine, to 
to uh, come clean about uh, what he was up to in certain cases that we really don't know. Uh, when did he decide that uh, the U.S. could, after all, get along with unilateral withdrawal of troops from Vietnam? Now, the public was led to believe that Nixon and Kissinger intended from the beginning uh, what finally happened, Ho Chi Minh becoming Saigon, uh, Saigon becoming Ho Chi Minh City after a decent interval. I know that's not true. They had no such intention. They were forced into that position. The question is, when did it, when and why did he finally decide that they would have to put up and try to do with air power alone? That was his intention without troops. I'd be very interested in that, see if just possibly he would tell me. Uh, nothing he would tell me would be the last word, but it could be very interesting. Well, I, I certainly don't want to hog this uh, interview, so if other people have questions that you want to ask. Uh... <clears throat> I have one. Uh, uh, you spoke at near the end, I believe, um, uh, about you know, lessons learned and you know, not learning lessons or actually uh, Remembering the past and still, uh, you know, doing the wrong thing, sort of thing. So I'm thinking of like, le what what about lessons learned, uh, not from yourself, but what do you think the lessons would be learned, for, like from someone like uh, Johnson or even Obama or anybody in that position, from uh, the release of the Pentagon Papers, and and <coughs> what would what might they have learned? What, what might they have learned from that, or uh, or not? Well, I did urge, let's see, perhaps it was the last time I saw Kissinger for a minute. Um, it was in fall of 66, um, it's not, I mean, uh, 69, 70, no, it's very Yeah, fall of 70 in San Clemente, I saw Kissinger, and I, no, I did see him one time after that, that's kind of interesting. But when I saw him in the fall of, six, of 70, it was to urge him to read the Pentagon Papers. And if he couldn't read them all, which is, takes too long, right? he couldn't read even a large part of it, he said, read the summaries. Because those add up to about 40 single space pages. That's readable. You know, and you learn, you learn a lot from reading the summary, four or five pages to each of the volumes. And he said, he had a, I asked him if he had a copy. He did, in the White House. So I said, uh, let to read it and have your staff person like Winston Lord or somebody, you know, go over it and uh, summarize for you some messages from him. And he says, do you really think we have anything to learn from this? I said, well, yes, I do. He says, but after all, they make decisions very differently now. I said, well, Cambodia didn't look all that different. So he said, very nervous. He said, Cambodia was done for very complicated reasons, meaning things like they were punishing Congress for having rejected Hainsworth and Carswell, and uh, I could name other domestic political reasons that were going on. I said, Henry, every rotten decision in Vietnam in 30 years has been made for very complicated reasons, and they were usually the same reasons, the same kind of reasons, winning an election, doing this and that. It's always domestic politics. So. Uh, uh, but, uh, and I said uh, something about the people who had resigned from his staff at Cambodia. Tom Schelling, who's in the movie, my old thesis advisor, who was a close friend of Kissinger's. Ernie May, others who worked on the Pentagon Papers. Something about them. He said, but they didn't have the clearances. And I said, oh, I had the clearances. He said, oh, you, of course, you know, very different, I know. And so forth, and uh, uh, you know, I just, I'm just remembering this conversation. The, uh, he goes on. What was it? He says, uh, "I think that your policy." I told him what I thought his policy was, and I thought it's really very like Walt Rostow's policy. He says, "Walt Rostow's a fool." I said, well, that may be, but McGeorge Bundy is no fool. He says, "No, McGeorge Bundy, who had been his dean, McGeorge Bundy was no fool." But he had no sense of policy. Um, this conversation, but the the last conversation I had with him was some months later at a conference at MIT, where I asked the question that could very well be asked of Obama right now. 
or of his national security advisor. Um, it was it was a conference called Runny Mead, uh, the name Runny Mead, meaning like the barons who had confronted John the first. And these were, in other words, very pretentious. These were MIT students and their parents who felt they were confronting the king, you know, monarch, to confront him about Vietnam. And uh, so I knew I had only one question. I had time for only one question. So I asked him, I said, what is your best estimate of the number of Indochinese under your plans who will die in the next 12 months? And he said, you are accusing us of racism. He said, no, 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 forget the word Indochinese. How many people will die if your plans are carried out as planned? What's your best estimate? As I said, I know we have estimates for the number of rubber tires they'll bring down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and how many bombs they'll need, how many replacement bombers, how many troops, and everything. How many people will be killed? He said, that is a very cleverly worded question. <laughs> and I said, uh, he said, what is your alternative? I said, Dr. Kissinger, I know very well, because it worked for him only for once. I said, I know very well the language of alternatives and options. I'd written his options paper, the first one he submitted to us. And I said, I know the language of options. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking you for your estimate, if you have one, of the consequences of your chosen course of action. He just paced back and forth. And finally, uh, the master, the, the student who was running things said, well, he's answered enough questions uh, for tonight, and uh, he has to get back to Washington. And so he did, by the way, because earlier on, earlier on, somebody had asked him a question, something or other, and he had burst out and said, you're asking as if uh, we were widening the war. We're not widening the war, we are winding down the war. So he goes back to Washington. And it, I won't go through the whole story, but I'll tell you that what turns out is that he goes back to supervise the pre-invasion bombing of Laos, uh, uh, which uh, extended the war the next day, the next day while he was talking to them. But I knew that uh, I was pretty sure that he simply did not have an answer to the number that had been killed. I don't know the timing of it, uh, but there's also the moment on the tapes, some of the tapes where Nixon is actually asking him a similar question, and in that, asking if we asking Kissinger, if we bomb here, if oh we yeah, no, us, I know that how many people would be killed. Yes. How many did we kill in Laos? How many? No, that's how many could how, we kill how, if we did how this? How many could we kill in Laos? Yeah. Oh, 20,000. Uh, he said, uh, he says, no, no. He said, no, I think we should kill. I think now we should hit the dikes. Hit the dikes. How many would that drown? Oh, about 200,000. No, 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 I'd, I'd rather use the nuclear bomb. Got that, Henry? Oh, I think that would be just too much. Too much, Henry? Nuclear bomb? Does that bother you? I just want you to think big, for Christ's sake. That's the passage you're That's talking. almost word for word, yeah. <laughs> and um, that's the way it sounds. Now, uh, what I'm saying now is that would be a very good question, the one I asked earlier, same one here, of Obama right now. Next press conference. What's your best, or uh, Panetta now, Defense Department, or Gates before he left. What's your best estimate of the number of Afghans who will die under our plans in the next year? Not a point, what's a range? What's the range going to be? And what was it last year? And how accurate was that turn out to be? Et cetera. Now, in the case of Kissinger, I had been almost sure they didn't have an estimate, and the reason was that I had proposed doing a study of that a year and a half earlier under Kissinger, and I knew that they had not done it. Kissinger said, we have asked them enough questions, now we don't have to ask them. So I called up Winston Lord, his now deputy, just before I asked the question at MIT, I really told this to him, just to check, and I said, uh, Winston, you remember that study I proposed uh, a year and a half ago? Did you ever do a study? of how many we were likely to kill. He said, no, no, never done. Okay. So, so, uh, so I, I sort of knew the answer, that Kissinger didn't have an answer to this question. Now, interestingly, now they've learned a lesson. Now they've said openly, over and over, we don't count bodies. 
that's Vietnam. We don't do that. Well, it turns out to be false. As you saw, WikiLeaks shows that they were counting civilian dead. And it added up to 60,000. Now, that's undoubtedly a huge underestimate. But it's 20,000 more than Bush had said. And interestingly, the, the 60,000 they counted, looking at the, at the times and the coordinates and everything else, the Iraq body count realized that's 20,000 that we hadn't counted from our estimate of 100,000 dead that's based on newspaper reports. So here's an extra 20,000, which I would regard as newsworthy uh, from WikiLeaks, you know, some significance. But the question is, the American people do not demand, and Congress doesn't demand, unfortunately, I can't blame it all on the president. They don't demand to know how many people are we killing on this collateral damage. And the truth is that when they take credit for killing a, a terrorist here and a terrorist there in the Taliban, what they don't tell is how many people they've killed in the hunt for that particular terrorist. I've seen calculations on that. In some cases, you can say, well, to get this guy, it took 78 other people had to die because he wasn't here then, and he hit the wrong place here, and here there was a whole collection of people who he didn't know was there and so forth. And it, it adds up time over time, and finally we got it. Well, you kill 78 people or 17 people other than the one you're after, and their families join the resistance. Have you made an effort to, uh, to uh, advise or reach out to President Obama? No. Uh, Why not? Oh, because uh, I do hear people who do have access to him, like Kissinger and the others. Uh, my impression is that a very busy man, of course, obviously got a very difficult job, very complicated job. And when he talks to outsiders who don't have current clearances and don't have, uh, I will specify it further, but who aren't in the loop at that point, his only interest, like that of any president, is what he wants you to hear uh, from what he wants you to think he thinks or listens or whatever. I, I haven't heard of any useful interchange, whatever. A number of people that I do know, friends of mine, went to see him about transparency recently. And to get into the door, they did something that was actually really bad, really shameful. These were, uh, these were open government uh, groups of various kinds. I won't even name them here, but mostly the friends of mine. And they were induced to get in the door by offering him an award for transparency. <laughs> now, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the American Library Association could probably get in with him by giving him an award for increasing the number of national security letters that they've been presented with. And the ACNU could give him an award for closing Guantanamo. And uh, then you get the conversation. But it doesn't really affect the policy a great deal. Uh, they made a mistake on that one. And here, so here they give him a transparency award for the guy who is transparently the most secretive administration we have yet had, and that's some heavy competition. Uh, he is uh, he has actually using uh, state secrets privilege more promiscuously than even George W. Bush. He has has brought almost twice as many prosecutions for leaks as all previous presidents put together. And they're boasting about it. I've been announcing that for the last year or so, and people are astonished. Saying, what? Really? Yes? Well, it's, it's a small number. It's five versus three for all previous presidents put together. But his new Department of Justice person, Monaco, uh, who is getting in hearings now to get confirmed and, and who will be in charge of these prosecutions, is boasting about it. She says, we're doing twice as many <laughs> as, as previous presidents. Look how tough we are, how determined we are to stop things and so forth. And this is the man they gave a transparency award. I don't really have any confidence that, that what he would hear from me would uh, uh, serve a purpose. What, what do you make of our... I don't have the clout. You don't have the clout. I, I don't have a large campaign contribution, and I don't have the votes in Congress. Um. What do you make of our preoccupation with sex scandals? Yeah, I mean, is this some our, sort of well, distraction? We're all human, of, most of us are men in this room, but even <laughs> the, I don't know, maybe even women download uh, this stuff. I but wonder, do you think that it, what it, the it, gender it, bias is in downloading Tony Weiner's uh, material? I don't know whether <laughs> we're interested in that or not. But don't you think that, that it really distracts us? I mean, while we were so absorbed in the Clinton scandals, 
Yeah. All sorts of things were just... Well, on the one hand, who wouldn't rather hear about whether it's you know, some juicy sex scandal or something than this horrible stuff of what we're actually doing in the world, the number of people we might kill, or whether climate change is going to kill us all and so forth. So you can't blame people for wanting to be distracted, But uh, I would say. But uh, on the other hand, you can't blame people for uh, realizing, for just totally neglecting every other responsibility they have to inform the public or to discuss with each other and act as citizens. Uh, humans are capable of arising above, um, rising above this. <laughs> I'm thinking of a quote I saw yesterday. I don't know whether it's right for the uh, American Library Association or not. But uh, why not? Give it a you try. Can, you can edit it out. Somebody commented on somebody commented on uh, the Monica Lewinsky Clinton scandal. It was a woman. Uh, somebody who said, um, "God gave man a brain and a penis, but not a large enough food blood supply to use them both at the same time." <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's not my usual press conference. So I, I happened to see it yesterday on the internet. Uh, but anyway, the point being, though, that so easily we're so easily distracted, uh, and that, that nothing else is available, really, that's not excusable. Do you think that, uh, also that I, I had a similar type question, which is that you, uh, and again, it's a little lessons learned related, but is that why it's so hard for for people to uh, learn or understand? the connections of history, for example, our involvement with the Mujahideen and the, that whole thing, okay. actually. Well, here's one I, I would have liked to bring up if I'd had time for the Library Association, a piece of history that I'll bet most people in the audience did not know. And I only know recently, and I found one of the most shocking and unsettling revelations ever in my life. And I read it on the internet as a quote from the Monde Diplomatique, I think it was. No. French, another French term. And uh, earlier, then I found I had on my shelf Gates' memoir, earlier memoir, before he became recent Secretary of Defense, uh, both saying the same thing. Brzezinski said in this French journal in 1998, you can easily find it, Brzezinski on Afghanistan, on the web, 1998, um, that in 1979, middle, 79, six months before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. He had urged President Carter to fund, through Pakistan, extreme jihadists to oppose the, so the Soviet-backed, not a Soviet regime, but the Marxist uh, pro-Soviet regime in Kabul, in order to provoke the Soviets into invading Afghanistan. And um, uh, then, six months later, the same interview, Brzezinski says, on Christmas Eve, when the Soviets finally did it, and the main provocation was, by the way, Soviet fear that we would overthrow that regime in favor of a regime that would let us do covert operations in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, the southern, the, the Soviet, uh, later independent cables that had a lot of oil, and that they would fear that we would use Muslim extremists, like Al-Qaeda types, uh, that were still fighting, that we would use them, uh, the Soviets feared, to unsettle their own regions. And so to stop that, they would go into Afghanistan. Now, why did we want them in Afghanistan? So on Christmas Eve, Brzezinski says, when they invade, he says, now we have, he, wrote a, he said, I wrote a memo to Carter saying, now we have the chance to give them their Vietnam. Now, and so we did. Ten years later, they'd lost 13,000 men and got out. And we had given the Afghans, by supplying this entire time with money, finance, collecting jihadists from all over the world, creating Al-Qaeda, creating Al-Qaeda foreign jihadists from all over the world, we were helping fund indirectly, most of them didn't even know the money was coming from CIA, through Pakistan, through Saudi Arabia, into Afghanistan to fight the Soviets and bleed the Soviets. And we gave the Afghans their Vietnam. They'd been at peace before that. 
there was a lot of controversy. The regime in Kabul was very controversial. There was another Communist Party that was more, mono, more Maoist that was fighting the Moscow-oriented Communist Party. And there were others. There were all the people who were there today. There was controversy. There was no war. From 79, there was a war that we had fueled for the next 10 years and then beyond that. I, mean, I won't give the rest of the history. A million people died. A million died from various causes during that war, Afghans. Now, I, at 80, remember, first of all, let me just ask you frankly, and don't take it just because I know it, are you aware of what I've just told you? Did you know that history? I was aware more of the Reagan uh, expanding it, but no. I didn't realize No, so this much is about Carter. Carter. Yeah, Carter. I didn't realize Did you know that? Carter was no, no. Okay, Carter. let me just ask, go look at Gates' memoir, forget the name of that, because it's called Witness to History or something like that. And uh, he'd been head of CIA and things. Look up Gates, just look up Afghanistan in the index. Look at Brzezinski on the internet, Brzezinski, Afghanistan, 1998. And you'll find, I think you'll find I've quoted very exactly. And the French uh, interviewer says, well, do you have any regrets now? You know, because this is now, that, that was in 1998. There had already been the Al-Qaeda attacks on some of our people then, before 9-11. And he said, no, you're asking me to regret. That was one of the best things we ever did. In the eyes of history, which is more important? The end of the Soviet Empire or some stirred up Muslims? That's uh, three years before 9-11 and everything else, right? Brzezinski, very smart guy. Not one of his smartest or you know best moves here uh, altogether or, or assessments. Now, what that said to me, and I only read it a couple of years ago, and I urge you to go read it, and I'm, I'll bet very few people in the librarian, librarians would know that. It's all on their shelves. They've got Gates on their shelves, and they can get Brzezinski on the internet. Here's what that said to me. I remember very well uh, when the, when the uh, Soviets went into Afghanistan just at Christmas Eve. Uh, I saw that as aggression. I was told it was aggression. Uh, but Carter, I remember said at the time, how many people, do you remember that? Can you remember? Nobody here remembers? Come Which on. Part about? You're not that young. Mm -hmm. I remember. But, I remember. Uh, well, it's 79. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe you are that young. But uh, what I, here's what I remember. Carter brought back draft registration. Yeah. Carter oh, canceled I, our participation. I registered for Wait, the draft. Wait, Carter par canceled our participation in the Olympics because the Soviets had done this. And he said, I have learned more about the Soviet Union. Carter, you know, in many ways, one of our better presidents, looking back on it, much better than he looked at the time. But at this point, uh, he says, I uh, learned more about the Soviets in the last month, you know, than in years before, to see their real face, you know, like the time they shot down KAL, that's what Reagan said. You know, and he said, now I see who they really are, so, And he brings back registration, cancels the Olympics, he starts the rapid deployment force. We've got to protect the Mediterranean, I'm sorry, the Persian Gulf from the, uh, from the Soviets, you know, and uh, Indian Ocean. I took that all for granted, that seemed to me, and, and I couldn't even understand why CIA was doing this all as a covert operation. I said, he's resisting an invasion, why don't they do it openly? You know, the American people would support this. I would have supported it. Uh, why did it have to be a CIA operation? So for when, of course, we're, we're totally sowing, uh, reaping the fruits of that operation today, you know, totally. That was Pakistan, that was accepting the Pakistan nuclear program in order to funnel the money through Pakistan. It was backing the Haqqani group that we're talking about fighting today, right now. You know, that's who we were backing, the Pakistans were uh, backing the Haqqani group, and so forth. So those are blowback consequences. But the image of what, what our policy was, who our allies, what was going, to discover that what the Soviets had done was what we would predict they would do if we did the illegal things we were doing. Well, they weren't entirely illegal, helping covert operations. But we were, wanted that invasion. We wanted it, and we provoked it to the total. Of course, they say nothing about what it meant for the Afghan people. Carter doesn't, Brzezinski doesn't, Gates doesn't. That meant, as of this year, or last, last year, that we have been involved in fueling war in Afghanistan, not for 10 years as we read every goddamn day,
but for 30 years, and by the way, it does go back earlier because Eisenhower and so forth, we weren't fueling a war though. We've been fueling a war for nearly all of 30 years as we did in Vietnam. There would have been no war in Vietnam had we not fueled it, one side of it, with money and, and everything else. There would have been controversy, there would have been killings, but there would have been not have been a war. And in Afghanistan, there was a small period when the Taliban were in charge, when we probably weren't the major cause of what was happening. It was a matter of a few years. But for most of 30 years, we've been doing that. And that's what I was saying today when I said, when I read that, I said, not only was the policy totally different from what I thought, but that was a wicked policy. That was a cruel, ruthless policy. And when, uh, when uh, Brzezinski said, but it brought down the Soviet Empire. Well, that's a good thing on the whole, that, that development, good for, better for some people than for others, but uh, not, a bad, not a bad thing. But on the backs of a million Afghan dead? No, we didn't have any right to do that. And, uh, uh, and it was wrong. And it's wrong right now. And I'm saying that when, uh, when, when President Obama, who I voted for, and if I was in Florida or Pennsylvania or Ohio and it was a close election, I would certainly vote for him again without any question. I'd rather have McCain or the McCain equivalent, you know, now who, who wants to go even higher. No. But in, in the case of Johnson, he did have a smaller war than Goldwater would have had. He wasn't entirely the same as Goldwater. The Vietnam War could have been worse, much worse. If we'd done what the military asked us to do, we would have been at war with China, and we would have used nuclear weapons. The anti-war movement did have an effect, and the effect was not to shorten the war very much, but the effect was to keep a lid on the war. And some people will say, well, that kept us from winning it. Maybe they're right. I think they have their head up their ass. I think they're wrong, and I'm glad we didn't find out. Uh, but anyway, I'll take responsibility for that. I did a little bit. I did what I could to keep that war from getting larger. And if that was wrong, I'm guilty of that. That's my responsibility. But I think the American, the, Amer the anti-war movement did accomplish that and that was a good thing. Right now, we still have it ahead of us to, to prevent an invade, an, an, not an invasion, but an air attack by Israel on, we can't prevent Israel, but from the U.S. from backing an air attack on Iran by Israel. If Israel is crazy enough to do that, the chance that we will stop President Obama from backing that crazy idea is as small as it could possibly be. But it's not quite zero. Uh, yes, we do have a monarch, uh, and he's close to being an absolute monarch, but he isn't quite an absolute monarch yet. And there never was, you know, absolute monarchs lost their heads in the end. But uh, uh, we still have enough to give us some responsibility here. It would be a disaster if we attack Iran. And we can try to build uh, obstacles to that right now with, with some possibility of success. The, the escalation or the continuation in Afghanistan is inexcusable, even though practically any president who would get to be nominated would, would be doing the same. They would be all wrong. And it's happening right now. It's unjustified homicide. And unjustified homicide is murder. And it isn't first degree murder necessarily, but there are degrees of murder, and it is reckless endangerment. It's, it's uh, manslaughter. It's women's slaughter and infant slaughter. When people used to say to LBJ, uh, how many kids did you kill today? Uh, that was regarded as inexcusable Ladies, I should stay inexcusable uh, in being uh, wrong-headed in the like, It's a perfectly fair question. He was killing kids every day. He didn't have a right to do any of it. Well, I'm told it's, it's time to wrap up, um, but I would like to ask you just one last question, if I could, and that is, um, when you when you look back on the Pentagon Papers and you look back on your life and your activism. Can you tell me why you didn't say, as so many of us do, let somebody else do it? That's a very good question, which I've never been asked in 40 years. 
Uh, well, I'd, I'd certainly, uh, I'd certainly said that a lot, uh, not so consciously, but in effect, I had uh, my first leak was really in 1968. That was 10 years after I got a top secret return. And my first leak, and what caused that was the seeing the example of a very, very efficacious consequential leak by somebody else who leaked that the president, that this morning had asked for 206,000 more men on top of the 550,000 that he had. And that was in March of 1968. And Congress rebelled at that news. And I won't, uh, my book tells what I did then. I did a number of leaks in consequence of that. But I wouldn't have done it without seeing, my God, that was the right thing to do. That was really a very consequential thing. So I had the example. And uh, the second thing, but, and then I thought I would lose my, lose my job, my career, and probably be found out. And I wasn't just by a kind of bureaucratic glitch that fell through. They were going to prosecute me, but it got aborted. But, uh, and I continued to have access. Another mistake. So a year and a half went by. But meanwhile, then I had read Martin Luther King and I had read Barbara Deming, D I D E M I N G, Revolution and Equilibrium. I had read uh, Gandhi and Thoreau. And Thoreau's line cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. And I was hit. But the key thing was that I met people right before I copied the Pentagon Group. In late August of 1969, who were on their way to prison. So they were going. I was letting them go, in effect. I saw here are people just like me. One of them, Randy Keeler, had gone to Harvard just like me. And a young man now. And he was going to prison because that was the best thing he could do to protest the war. So that example then, which, and I, as I said last night, you weren't there last night, were you? Yes. No, but you heard me say, I think I may have been the only person I knew who had met a draft resistor who was on his way to prison. It's just a different world. They didn't interact at all. And um, uh, I wonder if Obama, well, I'm sure that Obama, I'm sure that Obama has never sat in a room with a draft resistor, like uh, with somebody who refused to go back to Iraq and was imprisoned for it, like Camilo Mejia or Aaron Matata, who uh, who uh, refused to go to Iraq and, and was on court martial for it, lieutenant, or uh, uh, I could say Jeff Patterson and the Gulf War, but uh, Matthew Ho didn't go to jail, but who resigned from the Foreign Service uh, as the highest Foreign Service officer in one of the provinces in Afghanistan for all the reasons I've given. He had been a Marine company commander earlier. Like me, he thought of that as in Iraq. We agreed having a Marine company is the best command, best job you can have, perhaps, in the world almost, the best job I ever had. And uh, he loved that job. Then he became a civilian, was in Vietnam, in uh, Afghanistan, the other Vietnam was um, And resigned that, saying it was hopeless, it was counterproductive what we were doing, corrupt, this, this, and that, all, everything I would have said. Matthew Ho, H-O-H. He came back ready to testify. He was offered a job by Eikenberry, who agreed with him to be ambassador in Kabul. Alfred, why? To keep him shut? No, because he was such a good, terrific uh, officer, person, as was with Tata. He then comes back here in his debrief by Richard Holbrook, who offers him a job in the White House. For that, he accepted in a week. How can you refuse? And then he realized, wait a minute, this is going to shut me up. I can't say anything here. He resigned that after a week. He offered to testify before Congress. He was not asked. Right now, it's not too late for President Obama to pull in Matthew Ho, H-O-H, and sit down with him, wherever else he wants in the room. Ho won't pull back, pull any punches on that. He'll learn a hell of a lot more from him. But actually, he's hearing pretty much the same from Biden and from Donald and from everybody else. So I'm not sure it will make that much difference. But has he actually met somebody who's given up a career for this reason, who would say to him what Ho could say, or what I could say, but it sounds self-serving, but let's say what Ho could say. 
Mr. President, winning the next election is important for all the things you want to do, uh, for your legislative program, for keeping out these crazy people who want the job, and uh, crazy people in Congress. It's not some unimportant thing, but it is not the last word. It's not a sufficient reason to kill people at a large rate. Uh, you should reconsider whether what seems self-evident that the only thing that matters is holding this job so you can do good things in the future at the cost of any number of lives is not actually a justification. It's not an adequate reason. 